Bingo. If you're a grown up and you want to play Sermon Bingo, we won't um, check your ID. Yes, so let you Ms. can Natalie have Miss Natalie give you a card. Um, what, what we did in first service, I want to ask Hannah to, to do this again. Last week during Kids Spot, um, the story was about Mary and Martha, and it was um, talking about we don't have to be perfect. God just wants our best. And then this week's story is about worry, and I'm thinking. That's not something just for kids, is it? You grown-ups out there, we've dealt with worry. We've dealt with um, feeling like everything has to be perfect. And so I wanted, Miss Hannah, just to close this time by just praying over us. Um, if you are struggling or dealing with worry, whether you're little or grown-up like me, um, would you just embrace what Hannah's going to pray over us right now before we get into our sermon? So, Hannah, would you pray for us? Yes. All right, let's pray. Lord, I just pray for every single one of those cards that the kids wrote on today, whatever it is they're worried about, Lord, I just pray that you meet them where they're at, Lord, and you help them to know that you can comfort them, that they can trust you, that you want to help them in their worry. And I just pray that over every single person in the church today, inside this theater where we are having church. I, Lord, I pray, Lord, that we can give our worries to you and that we can learn that you are a trustworthy God and that you are here for us in every single worry and that you want to help us too. So I just pray this all in, our, all in your name. Amen. Amen. Okay, give Miss Hannah one more hand. Thank you, Miss Hannah, for doing Kids Spot. Um, well, good morning. I do have a question. I asked this first service, and there were like two people that knew. I did not know this. On that transportation game, how many of you know what a Zamboni is? Besides Crystal. It's Shannon, what is it? Yes! Okay! Ding, ding, ding! Um, yeah, I had no idea what that was, but that was a fun game. Thank you, Miss Hannah. Well, I am really excited to see your faces today. Um, I wish that we could just pause everything and get all up in each other's space and give each other a big old group hug because some of you guys I haven't hugged in months, literally. We're not going to do that because of social distancing and all of that, but just imagine how fun and great that would be. Some of you guys are like, oh my goodness, I could keep six feet away from you the rest of my life. No, I'm just kidding. We are going to dive in. Um, I'm excited to dive in week two in our sermon series, our summer sermon series that we started last week, looking at the life of Joseph. Um, how many of you have heard of Joseph in the Bible? Okay, this is not the Christmas Joseph, like Mary and Joseph. This is way earlier than that. This is a guy named Joseph that's all the way from the first book of the Bible in Genesis. Genesis 37 to 50 is where you'll find his story. And our series this summer is, I want to kind of compare it a little bit to like a mini-series, like a Netflix mini-series. I know y'all have been watching a lot of Netflix. And you know how like a mini-series, it like builds on the week before, Okay. So we laid the foundation last week for Joseph. If you weren't here, I want to encourage you to go back and listen to that message just so you can have the foundation laid. That was like episode one, okay? We're going to continue on with that today. And where we started last week was just who in the world is this guy, Joseph? So Abraham, you've probably heard of Abraham. He's known as like the father of our faith. Well, Abraham had a son, Isaac. Then Isaac had a son, Jacob. If you go ahead and throw that slide up. Um, Isaac had a son, Jacob. And then Jacob had 12 sons, and one of them was Joseph. So like I said, last week we explored a little bit about Joseph's um, family dynamic there. But the thing about Joseph's life, and what we even decided to just title this series for the summer, there are so many things in his life that are unfair, can you just say unfair with me? Say unfair. Unfair. There are so many things in his life that are unfair. You know, he gets the short end of the stick a lot. And I don't know if you've ever felt like anything is unfair, but as a mom, I hear this all the time. That's not fair. Anybody else that has more than one child hear that? That's not fair. He got 10 more seconds on the tablet than I got. She got more chocolate on her ice cream than I did. He never gets in trouble for the same thing. It's not fair. And, okay, please, like, give me some sympathy here, guys, okay? 
Um, yes, that's not fair. Does it get any better, Shannon, as they grow up? No, okay. Well, <laughs> not to dash all your hopes, but um, so I, I actually told my kids, we made a rule in our house, and when I say, when I say we, I mean I made the rule that if anyone says that's not fair, if I hear that word, they owe me a dollar. So the first thing when I told them this new rule the first thing they said was, that's not fair, you're going to take our money. And? Well, uh, we never paid you. <laughs> <laughs> so I go in their rooms, I get a dollar each. And I go to Sonic and get my Route 44 Diet Coke. And there we go. So, unfair. And I'm like thinking, okay, all the kids here, all the kids watching online are glad that you don't live in our house. And you can say amen to that. But, seriously, have you ever felt like this? Have you? Not in like the whiny kid way, but in a real way. You know, someone maybe gets promoted at work, and you are way more qualified than they are, and it, it just doesn't seem fair. You know, someone gets a break in one of their classes, and you are working your tail off, and it just doesn't seem fair. You know, maybe you're, you're all grown up, but there's that one person in your family that, that always gets all the help, always gets all the attention, always gets everything. And it's just, it's just tiring. I'm just, that's just not fair. I'm tired of it. Or what about maybe you've had someone spread um, rumors or lies about you, and you can't reel them back in. Now they're out there. And it, it's just very unfair. And see, we could, we could give a million scenarios that have happened in your life and my life that just are not fair. And we would be in good company with Joseph. Because time and again in his life, there are many situations that just were truly unfair. But somehow we see, and we are going to see over the course of these weeks, that God seems to use and redeem those things. God can use and redeem anything in our lives. And he does that for Joseph, for Joseph's own good and for God's purposes. And so we're going to look into that today. You know, I just want us to lean in for a few minutes and I want us to see if this, um, this ancient book called the Bible that I just happen to believe is the inspired word of God Let's see if this ancient book has anything to say in Joseph's story that can relate to our life at all. So I want to just share where we kind of stopped last week. Where did episode one end last week? We left off with Joseph. He was being sold into slavery. He was tied up walking toward a distant land, toward Egypt. And he was headed to a place where he didn't know anybody he didn't know the language. His family name meant nothing. And he had been rejected by his brothers and sold into slavery. So that's where we're picking up in Genesis 39. And that's what we're going to look at today, Genesis 39, right as Joseph arrives in Egypt. So I want to look at this slide. Can anyone tell me what, what is that picture up there? What is that? It's a roller coaster. How many of you love roller coasters? Raise your hand. Okay, how many of you are terrified of roller coasters? Yes, I am. Yes, I don't ride them. How many of you, your life has ever felt like a roller coaster? Anyone? Okay, me for sure. And I bet if y'all were being honest, you would say that your life has sometimes felt like a roller coaster too. And this chapter, this season in Joseph's life, it's like a roller coaster for him. It's up and down and all around and up and down again. And it's all over the place. But I want to, to see today that there are some lessons that Joseph not only learned, but embraced in this season of his life along the roller coaster, a season that was so uncertain for him. And so we're going to dig into Genesis 39. I want you to read this chapter this week. Um, there is so much in there. You'll be exhausted by the time you get to the end of the chapter. Uh, but there's so much. We're going to look at the ups, the downs, the all arounds. 
And let's go ahead and start in Genesis 39, verse 1. It says, Now Joseph had been taken down to Egypt. Potiphar, an Egyptian, who was one of Pharaoh's officials, the captain of the guard, bought him from the Ishmaelites who had taken him there. So Potiphar buys him and takes him home. And verse 2 says this, The Lord was with Joseph. Can you say that with me? The Lord was with Joseph. Now, sometimes when I'm all alone reading my Bible, I talk to my Bible, okay? I don't know if you do that. I do that. I do it when I'm alone so no one, you know, thinks I'm crazy. But I'm reading this, and what I say when I read this, the Lord was with Joseph, I, I kind of blurt out, really? Really? The Lord's with Joseph? Well, if the Lord's with him, why is he a slave in Egypt? You know, I mean, does your mind ever go there? You know, maybe you've been in a difficult circumstance and you, re- you realize and find that, yeah, the Lord is with me during this hard time and you take comfort in that. But then do you ever wonder, well, if God's with me in the middle of the hard times, why didn't he just save me the trouble? Why do I even have to go through this? You know, if God was with Joseph, why didn't he just save him the trouble, save him the trip of going down to Egypt as a slave, right? But we see here the Lord was with Joseph. And that's going to be important for for what comes next. Verse 2, the Lord was with Joseph so that he prospered. And he lived in the house of his Egyptian master. Okay, check this out. Verse 3, when his master saw that the Lord was with him. Okay, pause again. I'm sitting here reading my Bible and I'm like, wait, what? His master saw that the Lord was with him? This jumped off the page at me because wait you mean joseph the slave was living in such a way that potiphar noticed that the lord was with him that god was with joseph whoa joseph was living in a way that potiphar took note of i'm sure that joseph was not the only servant was not the only slave in potiphar's household But something was different about Joseph. And Potiphar noticed. What was different? What was it that Potiphar noticed that made him recognize that the Lord was with Joseph? What was it? I started just kind of making a list. Maybe he was honest and a hard worker. You know, maybe he treated others fairly even though he had not been treated fairly. You know, maybe it was that he was dependable and thorough and trustworthy? What, what did Pharaoh see? Maybe that he spoke kindly and with compassion? You know, maybe he demonstrated integrity and competence? You know, what was it? it there was something that says, that, that Potiphar noticed when it says, his master saw that the Lord was with him. And this statement pa- caused me to just pause and take inventory in my life. What do people take note of when they look at me? And what, I'm not the only one here, what do people take note of when they look at you? When they look at your life? When people see the way I relate to my kids, besides stealing their money, when people see the way I relate to my kids, do they see that the Lord is with me? When people see how I handle my money. Do they see that the Lord is with me? When people see how I respond to unfavorable circumstances and all the chaos in our world right now, do they see, do they take note that the Lord is with me? You know, when when people see how I treat people, how I talk to people, when people see what I post, do they take note that the Lord is with me. And this says that Joseph's master saw that the Lord was with him. And I just want to, this is our first lesson along the roller coaster. Because, yeah, I mean, we're kind of going up here, but we're going to go all over the place in this chapter. But the first lesson, live in such a way that people see God. Can, can you hear that again? Live in such a way that people see God in your life. Can you say amen to that? Live in such a way that people 
see God in your life. You know, Joseph, we, we saw last week that Joseph was his daddy's favorite, right? When he was back home, life was good. Life was good. I picture it like, like this picture on a roller coaster. He's having fun. It's thrilling. Everything is amazing. He's smiling. Life is good, right, on this, this part of the roller coaster. But then he goes down to Egypt as a slave. And this is what I picture. He was maybe scared. He was maybe not sure. He goes through all the emotions. Like, look at the girls up front. They look scared. But then this would be me in the back. Can you see that girl in the back? She's like literally terrified. She is literally terrified. You know, up, down, up, down, all over the place. And as I was like just contemplating this idea of like, roller coaster and like looking, you know, so for, for these fun pictures, um, I could not resist putting this next picture up. Put the next picture up. This is Jesus on the roller coaster, guys. Is that not the best picture you've ever seen? This is Jesus on a roller coaster. It is, but Jesus doesn't look like he's having that much fun, to be honest. But you know what? Someone noticed that the Lord was with Joseph. And even if your life is all over the place, do people see that the Lord is with you? You know, that that's my prayer. You know, that's one of the lessons on the roller coaster. You know, like I said, Jesus doesn't look too sure on this roller coaster, but have you invited him to be part of whatever the chaos is, whatever the craziness is, to where people take note that the Lord is with you? You know, let's keep on looking at, um, at what happens next. So verse 3, his master saw that the Lord was with him, and this is what happened. And that the Lord gave him success in everything he did. Joseph found favor in his eyes and became his attendant. Potiphar put him in charge of his household. He entrusted to his care everything he owned. So Joseph got a big promotion. Yes. But this was a promotion that he never wanted. He never had the aspiration to be the head servant in an Egyptian household, right? He got this big promotion. You know, maybe things are looking up a little bit. You know, I guess if you want to make the best of your situation, you know, I guess this is better than not being in charge. But see here, Joseph doesn't waver. And, and we're not going to read all the verses that follow right now, but I want you to read this this week because if you read in the next couple of verses, it says that the Lord blessed both the house and the fields of Potiphar because of Joseph. So Joseph actually was able to look at his boss and say, you're pretty blessed to have me. You know, I mean, I don't know if you've looked at your boss and said that. I don't recommend it. But this in this case, Joseph, the, Joseph just being there caused Pharaoh's household and his fields to be blessed. So things are going okay. You know, it's not the great, as great as being at home, being daddy's favorite, but, you know, I'm earning a little favor. That's great. Okay, we're still on the ride, guys. Verse 6. Now, Joseph was well-built and handsome. Joseph was a hottie. He was a hottie. He was cute. He was nice looking. He was a babe. I don't know what's the cool thing to say these days. I'm not hip. But in my days, you said people were hot. They were hottie. I mean, he's got nothing on Pastor Rodrigo, my husband, but he wasn't too shabby, you know? So Joseph was handsome and well built. Verse 7 After a while, his master's wife took notice of Joseph and said, come to bed with me. What? Okay, Mrs. Potiphar is propositioning Joseph. Okay, if you haven't read the Bible, if you don't think the Bible's interesting, like you haven't read it, the Bible is pretty interesting. Okay, what is happening here? Mrs. Potiphar going after Joseph, our guy Joseph. Joseph is surely tempted. You know, let's not pretend that Joseph is holier than thou. When this happened, Joseph was 
about 18 years old. He was a young man, about 18 years old. And what good reason did he have to turn Mrs. Potiphar down? What good reason did he have to walk away with his character, with his integrity from this tempting woman? You know, what does he decide to do? He's on this roller coaster. Like, this was surely a sharp turn, right? Verse 8, this is what he does. He refused Mrs. Potiphar. With me in charge, he told her, my master does not concern himself with anything in the house. Everything he owns, he has entrusted to my care. No one is greater in this house than I am. My master has withheld nothing from me except for you because, remember, you're his wife. That was kind of like a little, like, remember, you know, a little jab there, a little reminder. And then Joseph says, how then could I do such a wicked thing and sin against God? And all of a sudden, we have a picture of a young man who, at this season of his life, on the outside, to be honest, it didn't seem that God had been all that faithful to him. It it didn't seem that God had been all that faithful to him. Yeah, God was with him, but he's still a slave in Egypt. Yet, we see a young man that chooses to be faithful to God. We see a young man choose to walk in integrity and character. And, and this wasn't a one-time thing. Guys, victory over temptation is not a one-time thing. Verse 10 says, she spoke to Joseph day after day. She was nagging him. She was coming after him, and he refused to go to bed with her or even be with, him, with her. Day in and day out. You know, I am sure this is, was not an easy battle for Joseph. But we see Joseph stand up to temptation and another lesson along the roller coaster, temptations are going to come. We, we have a flesh. We, we live in a fleshly body. Temptations are going to come all along this roller coaster. And we see from this lesson from Joseph that we can stand up against temptation. We can stand up to temptation. You know, we can have victory over our flesh no matter what the area of weakness is. And and we see Joseph, a young man, choose to embrace that. Even though his life is crazy and out of control and not what he thought, and he he might even, you know, have place to to be a little upset with God. Lord, this isn't the place that I thought you were going to be, and yet I'm going to choose to live righteously to walk in integrity. We can stand up to temptation even if we're on the roller coaster of life right now in this season. And so surely Joseph was thinking, you know, okay, I did the right thing. Surely the Lord is going to reward me for such a for passing this test with flying colors. You know, I did the right thing. You know, I ran away from temptation. Surely the Lord is going to reward me. You know, I was thinking, my kids like to play Monopoly, and surely they, they, he was going to get a get-out-of-Egypt-free card, right? I mean, he deserves it, right? He should be able to, okay, you pass the test, you get to go back home. Wrong. That's not what happens. This is actually how the story goes. Mrs. Potiphar, she's not happy. She's not happy. <laughs> she ends up setting him up. There was a day she makes sure there's no one else in the house. She goes after him again. She propositions him, and Joseph goes running out of the house. But as he's running away, Mrs. Potiphar reaches out, grabs his jacket, and he just keeps on running. You know, and by the way, this was the second time he lost a jacket. Remember last week he lost his coat of many colors? Well, now he lost his, his jacket to Mrs. Potiphar. So Mr. Potiphar gets home. And his wife tells him a big fat lie that Joseph tried to assault her. Mr. Potiphar gets really angry and throws Joseph in prison. Go straight to jail. Do not pass go. Do not collect $200. There's no lawyer, no trial, no defense. Go straight to prison. 
And Joseph ends up in prison for doing the right thing. That seems unfair. He, he not only was not rewarded, he was actually punished for his, his upright decision. And so, roller coaster. Now he's at the bottom. And, you know, we just got done a few weeks ago with a sermon series that we called In the Meantime, What to Do When There's Nothing You Can Do. And Joseph is definitely in an in the meantime season right now. He's in prison. And, and we don't know what his thoughts were at this time, but let's just imagine if it were me or if it were you, my thoughts and your thoughts would probably be something like this. This is totally unfair. My integrity and in doing the right thing actually made things worse. My life went from bad to worse. Have you ever been there? My life was bad, but now it's worse. You know, the Lord was supposed to be with me. He said he was with me. I don't think so. He's not here. He's not in this prison. You know, and the text doesn't say exactly what Joseph was thinking at the moment. You know, surely he thought some of those things, right? But there's no indication that Joseph does anything else except keep on being faithful. As a young man, keep on being faithful, even on the roller coaster, even the ups and the downs. And this is how this roller coaster chapter ends. Listen to this. While Joseph was there in prison, the Lord was with him. Can you say it with me? The Lord was with him. Say it. Say, okay, here we go. One, two, three. The Lord was with him. Yes. He showed him kindness and, and watch this, granted him favor in the eyes of the prison warden. Now, to me, favor is not even knowing or being close to any kind of prison warden at all, right? But he showed him favor in the eyes of the pr prison warden. So the warden put Joseph in charge of all those held in prison. And he was made responsible for all that was done there. The warden paid no attention to anything under Joseph's care because the Lord was with Joseph and gave him success in whatever he did. So in some kind of strange and bizarre way, in prison, things even start looking up just a little bit, just ever so slightly. And today we're going to pause the story right there. We're going to leave Joseph in prison just for today. We'll, we'll come back for Joseph next week. But I want to pause there today because this is an exhausting chapter, isn't it? Like, I don't know if anyone else is exhausted after thinking of all that happened just in this one little chapter in Genesis. You know, if I put myself in Joseph's shoes, by the end of this chapter, I am certainly exhausted. I am probably depressed. I have eaten every comfort food that I could get my hands on, and I've probably survived several panic attacks. You know, this, I mean, all over the place. Some of you guys know what that feels like all over the place. And yet, Joseph's life seems to indicate that he embraced some of these lessons on the roller coaster. He didn't throw in the towel when he was at the bottom, or the top, for that matter. And maybe, maybe, there's some of these lessons from Joseph's life that could help us on our own crazy ride. And I just want to, I just want to pose these to you. If there are one, two, or th all of these, three, that you need to grab hold on in this season, even though things seem all over the place, I want you to grab hold of these. The first one. The lesson of living in such a way that others see God. Live in such a way that others see God in you, in us. You know, Potiphar recognized there was something different about Joseph. And our world is aching right now. Our world is aching for hope, is aching to see that there's something different. That there's something different in the pain and the hurt right now. And does the way that we live and speak and raise our kids and post on social media and handle our money, do, do they say to a watching world 
that the Lord is with us? You know, I, do, they, do, do people look at us and say, well, I don't even know if this, this God thing is real. But there's something different about Thomas. Or there's something different about Shannon. You know, there's something different about Rob. There's something different about the way they live. They live as if God is with them. You know, and then the second thing, the second lesson, this is a hard lesson on the roller coaster, that winning against temptation is worth it. Winning against temptation is worth it, even if nobody else sees it. You know, J- Joseph was basically punished for winning against temptation. You know, but what he was able to do was lay his head down at night with his integrity and with his character. And if you've ever laid your head down and had to wonder if anyone was going to find out that your private life was different than your public life, this is a gift. Winning against temptation is worth it. It is worth it. And we do see that at the end of Joseph's story. So even if you don't see it right away, it is worth it. And then the last thing that I want to just tell us today, and if you need this, just grab hold of it, is that the Lord's favor can find you, even in unfavorable places. The Lord's favor found Joseph as a slave in Egypt, in a dungeon, in a prison The Lord's favor found Joseph even there. And if you are in a tough spot right now, would you walk in the Lord's favor on you? You know, if you feel like your life is a roller coaster all over the place, what would happen if you and I were able to carve out a space to just reflect on, okay, Lord, what are you trying to teach me right now? I feel all over the place. What are you trying to teach me? And, you know, during this season, many of our... um, regular routines have been interrupted and if you're like me I'm trying to figure out okay what is what kind of structure does my life even look like maybe we need to restructure and carve time out in the morning carve time out in the evening to be able to reflect on what what is God doing in my life in the ups and in the downs am I trusting him to use the unfair things and the tough things in my life and so I want to I want to just leave us with I want to read a verse over us in just a minute. Um, Romans 8:28, a familiar verse. But I'm going to ask you go ahead and just stand with me. Go ahead, we're going to close in just a minute. Go ahead and stand with me. This verse Romans 8:28 and if the band wants to go ahead and come on up. It says this. I want you to listen. And we know that in all things God works For the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. I want to ask you just to close your eyes right now. I'm going to read that again because wherever the roller coaster is in your life, God doesn't cause things, but he works in all things. Close your eyes and just let this sink over you one more time. We know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. Lord, we are here today, and some of us are at the bottom of the pit. Some of us are climbing the mountain, Lord, and a lot of us are just somewhere in between. And God, we come to you and say, we want to learn what you have for us in this season, just as Joseph did, Lord. In the hard times when we can't see you, Lord, show us what the lessons are. Show us how to live for you with others watching. Show us how to stand up to temptation. Show us how to walk in this Lord, we thank you that, that your word speaks and is relevant to our lives today. And God, I ask for my brothers and sisters that you would just help them lodge whatever part of this story needs to lodge in their heart this week. And as we go out, as we as we go out and be the church, and we will give you.